Welcome back, everybody, to me being pissed off by the Wheel of Time. And today we are closing in on the end of Lord of Chaos. Um, this is the second to last uh, video. I'll wrap up the book today and I'll even maybe record the video for tomorrow um, today because I'll be traveling over the weekend and I believe in... No, I don't believe in preparing. I mean, I kind of believe in it. But it doesn't have it never truly works. So let's get angry about Wheel of Timey things, shall we? Well, cheers. <sighs> All right. So, um, where shall we start and what else should we talk about? Um, basically, we are finally seeing Perrin again, just when I was about to complain that the guy is gone <laughs> once again. I'm like, yeah, he, he finally shows up, which is unfortunately not too good. I mean, plot-wise, it's fine, but we get like one of the main things we need to be pissed off about today is a conversation about um, a happy marriage um, in that context. Um, what else happens? Rand gets into fights with Aes Sedai, or maybe not, and flees to um, uh, Kyrian. And, uh, well... Here's an interesting thing. Have you ever figured out, uh, realized that, like, apart from Andor, which has a capital called Camelin, every other country seems to just have, like, been named after the capital town. It's like Tyr, it's um, Ilion, it's, um, what's his name, um, uh, Kyrian. I mean, yeah, I know other, town, other places are not like that. Like, Tanchico is the, the town that is, like, the capital of Terabon. I know that, but it's, it's ridiculous how many of them are. It's like, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Um, world building doesn't work in this world, and I know that. So anyway, um, so he flees there, and I think that's where we'll have the big climactic whatever thing going down um, today. Um, however, at the same time... Uh, no. Matt and some annoying ladies march down to Ebudar, and that's about all the actual things that happen there. And we'll talk about why that part also sucks in a minute. Um, yeah, so plot-wise, nothing really happens, right? It's like... <laughs> yeah, nothing happens. Parent shows up, they talk a bit, um, you know... Whatever. Uh, Min shows up, which is, you know, the other thing there, right? Like, Min shows up and flirts with Rand. Um, Perrin shows up. Um, if Rand gets into something of a, you know, huff with the Aes Sedai and moves over to, Ky to Kyrian. Big deal. All right, so let's let's start talking about the annoying bits and analyze those and see what's, what's wrong and what's not so wrong and whatnot. And I want to start with um, a minor, not minor annoyance, but like something that I found like really dumb, but I think is um, indicative of like what really annoys me overall with the world, with the story. And that is um, during it, the Matt, um, Elaine, Nynaeve plot line, right? Um, because once again, like... <sighs> Matt has, you know, uh, the Aes Sedai in Salidar, that's, you know, Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine, kind of um, try to manipulate um, Matt into something because they have a big plan. And here's the deal, I'm pretty sure it will fail spectacularly and then Rand and Matt will have to save the day. Well, um, you know, we'll see. Um, so basically, they do all of that, and they do it ridiculously dumb. It's like, we, we kind of force Matt to stay here and do this because he promised to Rand. It's like, maybe there's all kinds of ways to do that that are different, but you know. Anyway, they're like, well, let's go down to Ebudar with Matt. So we have like an adventure adventuring group that for, you know, just like in earlier books, when we near the end need to force people together for ridiculous reasons, we'll do that now so we have... a climactic battle. Like, we'll see how that works. My point, however, is that you have Elaine <clears throat> and Nynaeve and Matt on that trip. And there's like two things going down that are annoying. One is that 
like Robert Jordan tries to explain, we see that from Matt's point of view, how Elaine is trying to behave uh, manipulative towards Rand and uh, Rand like Matt, and I uh, know <laughs> she behaves like a small child basically and Nynaeve as well and they're trying to figure out what's going down with like Matt's amulet the fox head amulet um incidentally that's actually pretty neat the the connection um with the the, the fox snakes and foxes game um to the Tyrangrial like the one in uh, Tyr when and the one in um well, wherever it is right now, you know what, which one I mean, like it was in Roydian, the, the ones that Matt went through. Those, that bit is actually pretty clever, that, that board game kind of reflects probably some prior interactions with those parallel universes, worlds, or whatever. I, I like that bit, so, you know, praise where praise is due. That was pretty neatly done. However, my point is, um, and I'm trying to make this work out, so my point is that those behaviors are extremely unrealistic. It's like, I guess Elaine is trying to, I don't know, um, make Matt subservient by um, kind of making his men, like, follow her. So, so he has to go along to maintain the idea of, like, being in charge. I guess that's the plan. But the way it is done is just, like, unrealistic as fuck. And I, I think that's like one of the really important things about this series so far. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Most of these characters don't behave like realistic characters. And it's, it's really interesting because when you look in like arguments in the fandom and whatnot, people are like, oh, I hate Egwene for this. I hate Elaine for this or whatever. <laughs> Mostly Elaine and Egwene get hated, I think. And the point is, no, you should not hate those. You should hate Bobby J for writing an unrealistic, hateable character that, that doesn't behave like a proper human being. And like, no human ever acts like that. And that's, that's like the weird thing here, right? Um... Uh, it's completely unrealistic, and I, I really, really find that bit annoying. There's also this, like, for some reason, I need is maybe scared of Matt, whatever. It's like, you know, <laughs> all of those interactions just feel like, that. I guess they're supposed to feel like a show, like how Aes Sedai manipulate men and whatnot, but all they show is, like, how inept um, Robert Jordan is at writing characters and how characters would actually manipulate and whatnot. It's like, you want to you wanna show those forms of manipulation that are definitely out there in the world, and please try to make a more, um, you know, realistic. The other part is the really dumb um, uh, horse dung um, incident. So basically what happens is the um, Elaine says, like, I want to check out your, like, amulet. It's a terra angrial. I want to know. And Matt's like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> you, can, you can try, but you can't get that thing from me because I'm not beholden to you, which is, I guess, at the end of the day, one of those things that I've said before. It's like, why is anyone doing what I said I want them to do? They have, like, no actual factual power anywhere because they're not allowed to use violence. I mean, not allowed to use their magic power for violence, and after that, they're just like a bunch of annoying people. Anyway, he's like, no, no, fuck you, and um, then everyone is pissed off. <laughs> and Nynaeve uses, like, her power to throw, um, like, horse shit at him. And you know what? I'm fine with that, but the problem is, and this is sort of it's once again, it's unrealistic in a way because, you know, yeah, 15 year old boys and girls behave like that. But Nanine's 26, according to her own testimony later in these books um, <clears throat> at this point. So why is she doing that? That's unrealistic and dumb. The other part is, and this is sort of what I mean when I talk about this being like inconsistent, which is a huge problem that I have with the entire series. The stakes are pretty fucking high at this point. The, Robert Jordan tries his damnedest to point out that like every possible moment a dark friend or whatever could jump out of the tree and kill people. Like the stakes are pretty fucking high at this point. But <laughs> people are still doing that <laughs> to... Uh, are still squabbling like kids at the end of the day. And it feels weird because, yeah, those two those two levels kind of don't match up at the end of the day. It's like, yeah, 
Is this a serious grown-up fantasy about people facing the end of the world? Or is this a children's book about Naughty Nynaeve throwing horse shit at Naughty Matt? Make up your fucking mind. And that's that's and that's I think something that like goes through the entire series and at least it starts to become more and more obvious now that we're like further into the series because like at the beginning in like you know I of the world we're like yeah well they they are basically kids and they're not exactly aware of the you know scope of what they've gotten into so yeah fine with that but now in book six we're almost halfway through this mess and they still throw shit at each other and I'm like what. Why? And it's not like that that scene adds anything to the story or anything. If you want to make a point that Nynaeve is pissed off at Matt and Matt is pissed off at Nynaeve, there's other ways to do that blend with that one scene that really doesn't do anything. Um, yeah. I guess the next bit that is, like, just mildly annoying is the whole Ebudar, um... Thing um, about the culture in Ebuda, which is apparently all about dueling and shit, and like yeah, it's it's fucking unrealistic once again. It's like bad world building. If you if you want to come up with a culture that is all about dueling, and where everyone has to duel because it's like part of your culture and it's always a duel to the death, like. How does that city survive? I mean, maybe that's the explanation of why humanity is on the retreat against, like, the wilderness in this world and all uh, and about to die out. Maybe they're dying out of stupidity and following cultures that are all about dying all the time. It's like, that doesn't work out. The whole, I mean, and I think that's part of why, uh, another one of these things that I want to get back to again and again is, like, people praise Wheel of Time for its wonderful cultures. And, like, just because Bobby J goes out there and, you know, paints gaudy pictures and shit on his, like, world. It's like, yo, and they have, like, these marriage knives. And I have this one, like, specific explanation of, like, how all these important symbols are in this one marriage knife. It's like, that doesn't make a good culture if the basis doesn't work. But, you know, I guess we just have to live with that. Uh, it's 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 mildly annoying. It's not too bad. Um, well, I mean, it's bad, but it's not that bad. There's other things in these books that are more problematic. So let's talk about those, shall we? First, another like almost praise. Um, I'm calling it now. Varen Varen Sedai Varen Matherin is Black Aja. I mean, everyone seems to be Black Aja, but she definitely is Black Aja. <laughs> um. But for for what it's worth, Bobby J. Robert Jordan <laughs> is trying to be subtle here. Throughout the events in, and that's what I want to look at now, throughout the events in Camelin, while, um, um, uh, you know, the Aes Sedai from Solidar are there. You, uh, we get this, like, explanation of like how subtly Varen manipulates everyone into like this huge conflict that will send that ends up with Rand fleeing to um Kyrian. And for someone who started out as this like, oh she just wants to learn stuff and she's slightly um you know um all over the place, confused and whatnot, but you know it was fairly obvious already in um, um, the Shadow Re Rises, right? Rising, Shadow Rising, um, whatever. That book, book four. Um, in the parent part, that suddenly she has this sinister air that she didn't have before. And this time around, it kind of gets put in more how she, um, you know, manipulates stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it this time around. I felt it was a bit on the nose in Shadow Rising. But it seems to just escalate, so I guess we'll find out that she's evil, I guess, maybe next book? Probably? <laughs> Possibly? <laughs> but yeah. Um, whatever. It's it, it's exactly that. She's, she's evil, and she tries to build things into, like, a confrontation between the Solidar Aes Sedai and the, um, and Rand. Which kind of works out.
Um, <clears throat> what else happens there that is sort of okay-ish and not too bad? Um, oh, let's talk about um, quickly the the whole like Black Tower Asherman thing. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It, it's fine. Now you have a Black Tower because we have a White Tower and we build we'll build this army of men that can channel and I'm fine with that it's mostly just solid and we'll we'll see also I assume Mazarin time will definitely um sooner or later betray um Randall Thor I just don't know when um so whatever but that that part is okay for now um clearly Robert Jordan likes his training camps um and that's sort of what we see there, that everyone just like shooting magic at stuff and blowing it up, which maybe is fun, I guess. But yeah, um, let's talk about the other bits. Let's talk about Min, shall we? So here's the thing. I, I like Min. I liked Min, is what I would say. Min's cool. Um, unfortunately, Min is now in love with Rand, because, you know, she has to be. I mean, we, we knew that from the start, and uh, Rand has all these women falling over themselves to get him, um, and whatever. <laughs> but the interesting bit is that now, and it started early on in, I think, once again, Shadow Rising, um, when she was forced to, you know, wear her hair long and be disguised as a woman for, uh, you know, a different woman. And now she's like... Still wearing pants, but she's becoming more and more, like, melting because of, um, Rand. It's like, a proper man, like Rand, um, <laughs> makes even the most, um, independent woman all weak-kneed and as, you know, feminine as possible, as biddable as possible. And I hate it. I fucking hate it. Why can't you have, like, one cool female character? That does not do that. I mean, yeah, you have Brigida, but Brigida is a different thing because Brigida is that one archetype of the female hero. <laughs> Whether in, and and he even goes back and calls her Mo, uh, Marion in one and um, Joanne in another one. So she's apparently the um, embodiment of all these um, individual female warriors that we have in mythology, which I'm fine with. So he has to have that one character, but like an everyday person like Min. I mean, yeah, she has a magical power of, you know, seeing the future or whatever, but mostly, um, yeah, mostly she's a very, like, average person with no special uh, special things, like special whatever. And to have one of those persons, I'm like, you know what? I like to wear pants and shirts. It's cooler. I want to have my hair cut short and fuck beauty standards or whatever. And once she falls in love with a man, she's like, oh, I might just like wear dresses, but I'll definitely start showing cleavage and shit. Like, the fuck? It's, it's you know, it's a problem that, like, all over, over the long and short of it, like, um, over, over the long haul, all women in these books will fall at the feet of men. And I'm like, annoyed by it, is what I would say. Very much annoyed by it. Um, but this is not the worst offender in this <laughs> in these chapters. There's there's more, as always. Um, so what else is going on? I mean, we still have the whole like Zulin is now um What's it? Zulin is now um, a serving girl and hates it. And Rand kind of clearly enjoys humiliating her, even though it's, it's supposed to be all about the toe and G toe and whatnot. And it's like, look, I like cultural ideas of honor and shit, but the idea that <laughs> I get the feeling that in these books, the the whole concept of G toe, as he calls it, Bobby J calls it, it for the ale is just introduced to find ways to humiliate women. That's just the only reason it is there, basically. And I find this kind of, like, I mean, maybe maybe I'm just a bit too suspicious here, but I, seeing it so far, it seems to be a reason to either, like, put, like, more masculine, you know, not masculine, but more um, assertive women, like uh, Zulin, into uh, dresses and stuff, uh, get um, Egwene whipped and shit. It's like, why the fuck is this there if it's not to gratuitously humiliate women for the pleasure of the male reader? 
That's like the only thing I can see in it at this point. So yeah, fuck that. Um, but I guess I've said that before, right? <laughs> Alright, so let's look at the big one and then do some more general rambling and shit. Perrin has to face his in-laws. Because, you know, he married Fael Zareen back in the day, and the parents didn't know about it. Now, he comes to town, and Bashir's there. We have that whole situation. Like, There's annoying shit going down there. A lot of it. <laughs> First of all, it's like um, like you have the conversation between Perrin and Bashir. It's like the typical, like, I want to make sure you take good care of her kind of speech. And I'm, I guess that's a, a speech a lot of, like, in a more patriarchal society, a lot of people have that kind of talk still with, you know, prospective sons-in-laws and whatever. <laughs> I didn't get that talk, but then I'm divorced again, so, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, my point is, um, that part is just ridiculously, you know, you know, standard conservative uh, bullshit, but I can live with that bit. Um, the interesting thing is that at the same time, um, Fail has to talk with her mother and explain why she ran away and married and stuff, because apparently she's too young to marry, which, I don't know. Um... <laughs> <laughs> there's like the situation there's like that that common night i just like fucking hate it being right but it's like <laughs> bashir and uh, what's his name uh um not bashir uh, i think i forget his first name but you know Fael's father and Perrin are on the way to the room where the women are. It's like, we need to get in there because it will probably, they'll, they'll fight and they'll escalate. It's like, probably, <laughs> let's, <laughs> this will not end with, <laughs> we'll have to intervene before it ends with one of them spanking the others. Like, of course it will end with that way. And then when they're at the door, you hear someone slapping another person in the room. It's like, come on, motherfucker. <laughs> Just for once, solve problems, not with um, fisticuffs, so to speak. Anyway, <laughs> then we go into that room and that's where the real trouble is. That's where the real trouble is because we Perrin gets a speech from Fael's mother, who... I guess has a name, but I have forgotten it, and who cares? And that speech, that speech is all about how a husband has to treat his wife. And she claims that the only way, the only way this will work is that the husband has to dominate the woman. He has to dominate the wife, because otherwise, if he doesn't show that he's very, very strong and can dominate her physically, she explicitly says physically, right? Um, if he doesn't do that, she will have to live with the fact that she has married a weak man, and that means she'll either hate herself or him for it. That's that kind of work. So he has to be he has to be a very a physically violent dominating male to do that. And you know what? That's wrong. That sucks. It's it's absolutely fucked up because it's not look, if you are in a personal in a relationship that is all about, you know, consensual dominance and submission, then I'm fine with that. That's your prerogative. But to put it in there as general marriage advice, and it is basically that, because once again, these kind of things are, they express theories. It's not just Mom Bashir that says that. Um, it is basically Robert Jordan thinking that that is um, a model for a, a valid model for a, for marriage. And no, no death of the fucking author, even though he's dead. No, this is ridiculous. This is fucked up and bad. It's like, this is like the worst type of super, like, ultra-conservative right-wing marriage advice that you see on YouTube these days. Like, all those people out there, what's their, what's their name, like, Girl Defined and all those fuckers. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, physical dominance is important. As I like, no, it's not. Physical dominance, physically abusing your wife or any person any person to show that you are the dominant person in a relationship is fundamentally wrong always a relationship is not a struggle for power 
It never is and it never should be. If it is, you're in a toxic relationship. You should probably step out of that. And I'm, I'm just really fucking annoyed that Robert Jordan puts these kind of things in there without any, like, actual comment. Like, how, showing people having that opinion in a book is fine. Don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. But maybe also show that that's not the way to go ahead. But you read these books, you read these sentences, like, parents are like, all right, I guess I have to physically dominate Fail, otherwise it won't work. So he's like, he gets like physically aggressive against Mom Bashir, and that really turns on Fail, who has to give him lots and lots of babies. And I'm just, uh, fuck that. I'm, I'm just annoyed and I'm pissed off that these kind of things are in there and no one goes and like, actually does anything like it's it, this should be like actually called out a lot more because the, the these are very unhealthy these are like really really um bad ideas so yeah there's that and um i'm i'm as I said, I'm really pissed off now. Another thing is that, like, with the last book, I guess, mostly with, like, Fires of Heaven and this one, the whole, like, reproductive aspect has become more of a focus. That is, like, it kind of dovetails with these ideas, these ultra-conservative views on, like, relationships and whatnot. But for some reason, it starts to be more about, like, the fact that women have to bear children becomes more and more of a thing that is, like, put out there again and again. Like, no. No one who does not want to should have children. And it is not okay to reduce women to being people, to reduce women to, you know, Reprodu uh, reproduction. That's not how that fucking should work. And the fact that it comes up again and again now and it's like, is made light of. It's like, oh, look at our, look at our mom and mom-in-law. She's all about like how many grandchildren she wants. So let's go and get fucking. And no, that's not the fucking case. That's not how that works. We're like getting more strong blood in the family because it's gotten weak. And it's like, what do you mean with strong blood and weak blood? Unless we're talking Habsburg chins here. This is really bad. It's like, what do you mean with weak blood and strong blood? There is no such thing as strong blood and weak blood. And anyone who believes that kind of shit is racist. Because that's where racism starts. All kinds of racism and eugenics and all that <coughs> fucked up Nazi shit, right? <clears throat> so yeah. Um, <laughs> having these kind of words pop up more and more in these books f is kind of troubling to me because what started out as just a bad fantasy book is suddenly becoming way more than that, Which, by which I mean it's becoming a very, very, very problematic right-wing fantasy book. I'm, I'm, I'm slowly... It, I'll still call it conservative and old and not aged well, but... We're crossing that line slowly with all these things in there because they they paint a an overall image. It's not just like you know using unthinkingly using a stereotype here and there. It's it's more and more of that crap, and yeah, I don't want this to become an overtly political YouTube channel. But man, I'm gonna call this out more and more. The more of that shit happens. All right, let's look more at the dominance thing. And I think that's like another part of it is like, while it is expressed very clearly here by um, the Lady Bashir, it kind of goes throughout the entire series. And it's, it's kind of bad in a way. But the, the entire world on the Wheel of Time is very much built on dominance, on, on like the idea of domineering someone else, dominating someone else to... Um, um, show that you're like the boss hog, basically. And I'm like, that's a very, very problematic worldview that, once again, like, that, like, everything is always about, like, 
trials of strength. It's like dueling in Ibudar. It's like Rand using his magic dick to slap down, um, you know, the Aes Sedai's magic, whatever they use. And he, of course, he can do that because he, he's more powerful and he's like Boss Hog now. And it, it, all of these stories are all about, in Wheel of Time, are all about, like, who's stronger? It's, it, it's one big fucking pissing contest, and that's not how societies work. That's uh, despite, you know, someone just starting a new war right now while I'm speaking. But, you know, apart from that, ideally, a society as a whole, while it will always have these, like, very... Um, macho ways of doing stuff, which is always like strength contests and pissing contests, does as a whole, a society doesn't work like that. It's about talking. It's about negotiating. It's about finding compromise, about living together. We're not fucking like, I don't know, top lobsters. <laughs> and even that stuff, like even those biology allegories are fucked and bad and wrong. But you know... <laughs> It, it it just seeps through these books more and more. That it's all about like who gets to you know push whom around. And as a fundamental structure for a fantasy world, it is very sad. I would say it's it's sad and harmful, and I I'm, I'm pissed off with it a lot, as you probably can tell. All right, let's look what will what what's left and stuff, right? Um, Aes Sedai are still trying to, you know, um, do something. So my, I assume that now what happens is <laughs> we have Elida's Aes Sedai in um, Kyrian. We have the other group of Aes Sedai. Oh, and ah, I almost forgot the whole domineering thing. Alana. You remember? And um, First of all, good on Bobby J. Once. He, like, with, like, one other person, when it's about, like, Alana bonding Rand against his will, he's just like, she would call this rape. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And I'm, you know, good on Bobby J to have a character actually realize that. The other problem, the really fucked up, toxic problem, however, is that later on, the same character is like, you know what? If it had worked, we had him under control now against his will with that. I'd be fine with it. We're basically, and they are basically, you know, shunning and demeaning Alana, not for, um, not for being, you know, basically a, a magic rapist, but for being a failed magic rapist. And the idea that, like, if it had worked, it would be fine is just as toxic. And once again, this, like, might is right kind of mindset that goes through the entire series. It's like, if you can push around people, if it's successful... Yeah, it's fine. It's like, no, it's not fine. It, it remains wrong. And the fact that these ideas just like bubble to the top again and again in these, in the, in these books is, it's frustrating as all hell is what it is to me. It's like, why, why, why? Couldn't you just like, you know, actually, look, I mean, if, if that is how Robert Jordan viewed the world, that's really depressing. Because that's not how the world works. And to say, I want to write a fantasy about a world that works like that. To show what? How fucked up it is? No. How wonderfully my story works in there. Like, yeah, well, if you ever have a story, then yeah, pr uh, probably. But, you know, no. <laughs> so, yeah, that that's just, like, absolutely annoying. And I'm, I'm getting more and more frustrated with these books. I really, really hope that the next one, which I'll start next week. Still need to find out which one it is. <laughs> Crossroads of Twilight? Path of Deck, something like that, whatever. I'll find out it's book seven. I'll read it next week and I'll probably be annoyed, but I, I really hope he kind of, you know, slows down on that part of like how he, how the world works, but I, yeah, who knows? Anyway, predictions what will happen in the last couple of chapters that I'll read today. Rand goes to uh, Kyrian. All those Aes Sedai congregate there. <clears throat> Luckily, Perrin is with him, which really helps. If also Matt would be there, it would be even better. And, well, I mean, maybe it'll all work out to the best with Matt and gang finding, well, the, the girls getting into trouble, Matt helping them, <clears throat> them finding the, the, the weather control thing. They teleport, gateway, whatever, to um, Kyrian just in time to have all three Taviran at the same place 
to foil the attempt of the Aes Sedai to um, do their like 13 people kind of thing. That's my prediction. And it will obviously it will obviously fail and Rand will come out ahead because he's boss hog in these books. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, I'll see you later. Until then, cheers.